cover of the morning this session instead of Charlie. Charlie needs to do another talk later on today in the oral session. So I'll be more in this session today. Welcome everyone to our session. So uh, our first speaker is Dr. Charles Sanchez from the Department of Water, Soil and Environmental Science. Charlie. So the title of our presentation today is Salt Risk Ultimately Come the Limit to Improve the Genetic Efficiency in Our Cropping Systems. And this is the area we're talking about. This is the study area we've been working in now for two and a half years. It's essentially our local seven irrigation districts. Over the years, we have got a handle on the hydrology of fur irrigation. Over the years, we've calibrated our models and we've validated our models with independent data sets. And that's what this does. It just shows the relationship between observed and predicted due to these models. We've also developed models for our sprinkler systems. So we have a good handle on the hydrology here. And this has enabled us to provide direction and operating these systems for maximum efficiency. And these are some of the models we published. It's just a manifold model, although we also have a gradient model, which the math equations are solved in matrix form. And more recently, with the help of Dr. French, we've been getting a better handle on the evapotranspiration of all the crops in our rotational system. We monitor salts. We, of course, we measure the conductivity of the water in the saturated paste extracts. In situ, in near real time, and through surveys, we measure bulk conductance. And we can go back and forth between bulk conductance and ECE through selected algorithms. Bulk conductance measures the conductance of the solid and liquid phases. So if we want to get back to an ECE where crop tolerance is already expressed in terms of ECE, we have to go through these algorithms to go backwards in our calculations. This is some of the instrumentation we use. This is an electromagnetic conductance unit. We've used both the Varus and the M38. We're partial to the M38. We use it most often. When we have to straddle furrows, of course, we go in with a spray coop I bought, stripped off all the booms and everything, and we use it to tow our EM38 through systems in which the beds are listed. A little bit about what it takes to remain sustainability. We have salts in irrigation water. Our soils have salts. The shallow groundwater has salts. So we have to employ a leaching requirement to remain sustainable. Otherwise, salts will accumulate to problematic levels. One thing I want to note, and I'll say more about this later, this assumes steady state, mass balance. It assumes salts going in must come out. And more recently, we found out that we may have to use some transient models because precipitation is more important than we previously anticipated, precipitation of carbonate-related salts. But to the extent that this is an error, it's an error towards conservatism with respect to crop protection. It might overestimate rather than underestimate a required leaching. So as a starting point, we'll stick with this until we have a better transient model. This is the cropping system we studied. Of course, we <coughs> start with standard establishment. We go through the irrigation management of the vegetable crop. Then we go into our rotational crop. And then ultimately, we have this pre-irrigation before the season starts over again. And through this entire cycle, we've monitored the salt ball budgets, the water inputs, and the ET, and done comprehensive mass balance. I'm going to focus on salinity. My colleague, Dr. French, will focus on water. Of course, we typically established that with sprinklers. Many years ago, we subbed up. And here, we pick up an efficiency right up the bat. We pick subbing up. We could use anywhere from 30 to 40 inches of water, whereas here, you know, we're using much, much less, typically less than five. Here shows some data. This is the that establishment cycle. These are several sites by irrigation district. This would be the wet dates. This would be our soil water deficit at the time we start the sprinklers. This would be the number of sprinkler events. This would be the total runtime. And this would be the water we applied in that standard establishment event. And in every case, we 
the sprinkler stand establishment event on the front end of our season, probably through almost Halloween, is a salt loading event. This is one side of art, but I can show you many of these. We end up with more salts at the end of staff establishment than before because our application efficiencies are, are, are very efficient. Essentially, we apply enough water to fill the profile to make our sprinklers operate as an evaporative cooler and not much more. This shows, this shows more data, such as like that bar graph, but more sites. And you can see our required leaching and our leaching fraction is the disparity there. Our required leaching is usually greater than the leaching fraction we achieve. And you can see in nearly every case, it's a net salt loading enterprise. And this is metric tons of salt to 45 centimeter soil depth. Now later in the season, after Thanksgiving, maybe even a little before Thanksgiving, when the weather breaks, our standard establishment event actually is, we do pick up a little leaking fraction at this period. But it's almost guaranteed through Halloween, it's a net salt loading event. I want to talk about the thinning irrigation because this is one of the few opportunities we have for picking up a leaching fraction in season because of our efficiencies throughout the season. We haven't gone in and cultivated yet. We haven't made our trapezoidal furrows with the bolas, and we have these white groves, and we want to soak that good to facilitate the thinning operation. And as you might anticipate, we do pick up a leaching fraction in our thinning irrigation. You can see both. This is in the bed. This is in the furrow. It goes up a little in the furrow. That's because the bed continues to drain. Water evaporates from the bottom of the furrow. But for the most part, it's a net leaching event. This is really our last in season. A little bit about how we irrigate lettuce. This is the mass metal level depletion. This is, lettuce should be irrigated when 40% of the available water is depleted. A typical silty clay loam holds about five inches per foot. We assume a lettuce rooting depth of a foot, 30 centimeters. We should irrigate when half the available water has been depleted. The available water is about 2.5 inches, only about half of it. And we should be irrigating when 40% of that's depleted. So we should be irrigating when about 1.2 inches of water is used. And this is what we would seek to do for optimum efficiency. Here's some data, observed data, and the results of my hydrological models. You can see we typically have a flow rate of about 20 to 30 gallons per minute per furrow. Our cutoff time is usually about an hour or less. And you can see we're able to achieve application efficiencies in season, after cultivation, after the bowls are set, greater than 90%. And because the <coughs> steady state infiltration rate of our soils are low, actually about less than five inches per day at, at, at saturation, we achieve high distribution uniformities as well because our opportunity time for depercolation relative to the advanced time is very small. Now a little bit about ET. This is typical data. Dr. French is going to show you a lot more of these. I just want to touch base. This is cumulative ET over the lettuce season. This was the winter lettuce. Uh, we get very similar results. On the front end of our season, we're using 10 inches of water. That would be the fall planting. On the back end, our last planties, we're using 12 inches of water. That's because the back crop is a lot longer crop. And it's not transpiration that's increasing, because transpiration is tied to carbon fixation. But the evaporation is tied to opportunity time in the field. So we go from like 10 to 12 inches. And we, we've repeated this across space and time, and we're very confident in those numbers. <clears throat> Little bit about net salt loading over the lettuce season. Here we have salt before pre-irrigation, before lettuce and after loaded lettuce. You can see in our vegetable season, it's a net salt loading event. And that's because we're irrigating very efficiently. We're not achieving our 20% required leaching fraction in season. Now I want to say that's not a bad thing because that's enabled us to manage diseases, particularly one of the two species of sclerotinia. It's enabled us to manage nitrogen more efficiently. When I came into the area three decades ago, a 400 pound breaker nitrogen rate wasn't uncommon. And now we're typically using 200 or less. So this isn't a bad thing that we're shifting our required leaching outside the management period. 
but you can see that we are indeed doing that. This shows some filled white mass of salinity. This is one of the lighter, this is a sandy loam, actually, and one of the few we have, actually. And you can see that salts increase. This is before lettuce, and this is after lettuce. Just another way to present the data, it shows a filled white map of salinity. Wheat. Wheat is a common crop in our rotation. Here's some ET data. Dr. Frank will show you more of these. Wheat quite consistently uses ET as two acre feet. You plant January 10th or you plant, plant March 10th, that's going to use two acre feet of water. That's the ET of wheat, quite consistently. But wheat, we're irrigating it so efficiently as well. Here we go through the pre-irrigation, the lettuce, the wheat. Wheat also is a net salt loading event. Wheat has a higher tolerance for salt than lettuce, so this isn't a bad thing. It can endure the elevated levels, but then the pre-irrigation we implement after wheat becomes, becomes of paramount importance for restoring sustainability to the most sensitive crop in this rotation, which is lettuce. This is wheat again. This is another view of wheat. This is a field and barred before wheat. This is a field and barred after wheat. You can see the salinity uniformly went up, and we would naturally have to do a pre irrigation to restore this field to a salinity level that will accommodate lettuce. To digress, a little different story of wheat, uh, a lot more friction and due to the tangled plants and whatnot. To digress, uses about two acre feet of water, much like wheat which is one of our other rotations, but we don't irrigate Sudan grass as efficiently. So Sudan grass, this is the field before Sudan grass, this is after, this is after a pre-irrigation. In terms of salt management, we gained a little from the pre-irrigation. Now that doesn't preclude other beneficial uses to the pre-irrigation. We need to decompose the residue, we need to do other things, but in terms of salt management, there's no gain to a pre-irrigation after the Sudan grass crop because we had a sufficient leaching fraction during the sedan grass crop. Um, this is a pre-irrigation, you can see. Pre-irrigation does reduce salinity. As I noted, it's of paramount importance in our system to getting our season-long leaching fraction of 20%, because we're not getting that in the main crop, we're not getting it in much of the rotational crops, although some we are. And we would not remain sustainable if we didn't do that pre-irrigation. Now, to the extent that our pre-irrigation is effective, the good news is it preferentially takes care of the bad actors. You can see we can get a reduction in sodium and chloride, which is what we would desire because these are two problematic, one problematic cation, one problematic anion. I want to talk about a little bit the, the salinity we're talking about. These are the cations and anions that we typically talk about. Here's what we typically find in Colorado River water, and this is what we typically find in the saturated case extracts of our soil water. What's interesting is the elevated carbonate levels. In a teaspoon of soil, we have billions of microorganisms. They're all respiring. They're all cranking out CO2. So the CO2 in our system becomes huge. And we've done some thermodynamic modeling and we can see we exceed the KSPs for a host of carbonate minerals. This clearly shows that with respect to some of our salinity, precipitation is happening to, to a much greater degree than I anticipated. And this is partially mitigating the salinity. So this is why I say the steady state model is probably not the appropriate model. Fortuitously, it's conservative from the standpoint of crop protection. But you can see we're, we're trying to develop some transient models that explain this dissolution and precipitation that's going on in our soil root zone. So to summarize what I've told you in the past 15 minutes is our irrigation efficiencies are very high with fur irrigation, exceeding 90%. And we are not reach, achieving the required 20% leaching fraction that we need for continued sustainability in season. That's not a bad thing, like I said. We can push it off out of season. That enables us to manage nitrogen, manage diseases a little better. The extent to which the rotational crop contributes to this leaching fraction varies. Wheat does not. But that's not a bad thing either because wheat has a higher tolerance. It will endure higher salinity temporarily. 
and that enables us to monitor nitrogen in our wheat crop and avoid dockage for low protein in our durum. But what's key is pre-irrigation is of paramount importance for sustainability. So it's, it's a controversial thing. People drive by and see us running water in an empty field. But it's paramount to sustainability. We're going to have to develop some transient models. Clearly, the steady state models that we're employing are falling, up, falling short. And finally, with the help of my colleague, Dr. Francis, and some others, we're trying to develop more user-friendly tools to track ET in our production systems. That's all I have to say. If there's any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Bobby. I'm always good for the first question. That's good. That's good. Yeah. Okay. So the entire time I was designing the irrigation system, I used the 10% leaching factor for this area, and it seemed to work pretty good. So now the university is recognizing 20% leaching fraction as what is the if you, if you If you plug in the tolerance for lattice, it's 20%. Okay. okay. I just don't want to do it wrong. <laughs> well, like I said, our 20% may be a little too conservative because steady, the steady state model is skewed in that direction. So maybe once we get the transient models working, maybe just incidentally your 10% may work. I don't know. Well, you know, you're... you're That's uncharted territory for me. Yeah, you're... Uh, uh, the maps that show the before and afters and the weeds and whatever, since so many of our fields are mixed with different soils, each soil is going to have a different... Absolutely. Of, ...of that salt, and it's, it's whether it becomes... Uh, a negative to the next crop or not, you know, and, and what the salts are. But we got to manage these soils so, so that the most problematic spot exactly. is sustainable. Yeah, you always yeah. farm to your worst piece of, yeah. piece of ground unless you can, get, uh, can cut it out and replace it with something else. So, you know, it, I, I understand that. But it just, you know, I, I don't know, I think it's, it's practical with, with the way we're farming now and, and the thing is we're, we're so accurate. There comes a point where you can't get more efficient without that. That's where we are. Yeah. So, and, I, and that's what the world doesn't understand, is that we're so efficient, we hurt ourselves by trying to apply less water. And that's a big message that doesn't get out anymore. And I would like to see the university talk about that more. The fact that you can, you can, you can save yourself out of business. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, sir. So in terms of pre-irrigation, we're talking about sedan, we're talking about wheat. We're getting some gain there, but not always. So we were not getting none. We, we lose even more ground. But fortunately, the crop is tolerant, so it, it so has no catastrophic effect on the crop. So then I guess my question is, how many acre feet are really required, and should we be doing that in one pre-irrigation or breaking up into two irrigation? That's a good question. Here's the deal. Let me put it in some math. If lettuce is using one foot and wheat is using two, two feet, your leaching fraction of 20% on that three feet is 7.5 inches. So your pre-irrigation, you would think, well, it should be 7.5 inches if we were nearly 100% previously. But it's not, because in that pre-irrigation, you're doing it in August. And two inches of that pre-irrigation evaporates from the soil before you get back in and rework the land. Yeah. So actually, on a 20% leaching fraction, your pre-irrigation is a little over nine inches. It should be, if you were 100 up to that point. Now, whether you can stack up nine inches well in a field or you want to do it in two, four and a half inch, I, I don't know that it'll make a difference. So then it's also the timing factor of when we actually got to get in there plant. How Absolutely. How much time you have to do it. So then is there a net benefit of cutting sedan one time and going back in doing pre irrigation in there? I mean, those. Are That's your problems. math. I, yeah, I can't answer that. That's your yeah, math. These are just things. <laughs> yeah. They hear over there were quite interesting to see here. That yeah. Some things maybe we thought were positives were actually turning out to be negative. Yeah. Well, also, too, you, you, you have to look at your soil profile and what the water hole capacity is. So it's either in a sand or a lighter soil, <coughs> you're only going to have a three inch or four inch in the whole five foot profile. So if you're putting nine inches on, you're just putting it down. Yeah. Down. If you have a water table problem or you're a piece of high ground that has a, a low field next to you or you're just moving your problem from one field to the next. So you have to look at, at all of those factors as to whether that's going to be the, the most effective way. <laughs> now, any other questions? I have to go to another parallel session. So I'll answer questions now because I won't be around at the end to answer questions. So if not, I'll move on and 
our moderator will introduce the next speaker. Thank you all. All right, our next uh, speaker is Dr. Andy French from USDA. Well, good morning. Uh, I'm going to disappoint those people that like to hear about soils. <laughs> Just, I've been reading last year about not talking about soils. I won't talk about soils. I'm going to talk about evapotranspiration measurement. I'm going to focus on the, the techniques for measuring it. So that, uh, the audience at least has a better appreciation of what these machines are all about. Because, uh, yeah, they're machines and you can press a button and go, but there's a lot more involved in that. And I think an appreciation of, of <clears throat> what has to happen behind the scenes to make those machines work and give you good numbers for evapotranspiration will be illustrative. So that's what I'm going to focus on. I'll also talk a little bit about the evapotranspiration of wheat and, and, uh, and lettuce, but Charles already presented those numbers, so there's no mystery there where we're going with, with those numbers. Uh, <laughs> Of course, acknowledgments. Uh, this is this is a big project. We're two and a half years into this from the Bureau of Reclamation funding, which began my involvement and began and some of that work began before that. And we have lots of people to thank, including uh, YC to uh, USDA, uh, people at NASA Goddard, NASA at JPL, and the technical staff here. So what I'd like to talk about here is how we quantify the water used by crops. So those are the numbers that Charles has presented to you. We want to go, go towards an efficient monitoring system, which the uh, speaker after me, Pierre, will discuss some of the remote sensing work of that. So what we're doing today is we're using the best possible technique for measuring crop water use. But those are not practical tools for routine regional synoptic observations. So we want to transfer that knowledge, those baseline water use measurements, to routine uses from remote sensing. And then lastly, we want to be able to use our techniques and models to forecast it. It's not very useful for you if we tell you how much water you use today, you want to know how much water you expect to use in the next week or so, so you can plan your crop season. Well, so how are the methods done? Well, this one goes back to the 1960s, at least. This is the gravimetric soil moisture measurements. We go out there and collect uh, soil samples. This was done by Leonard Erie and others, uh, and that's a major publication you're probably aware of. And these are aggregated over decades of water use. So you go out, you collect some soil samples, you dry them, you measure the, the water depletion, and you come up with curves such as this, which shows you, in this case, lettuce, and giving you eight inches, and shows you where it's used on a bi-weekly basis. The numbers are very, very good. They're applicable for the Mesa, Arizona area, and not necessarily for, for the Yuma region. So a lot of people may use those numbers as, as a base on observations. But these are expensive to collect, time-consuming, uh, and not representative of current practices. Uh, another method that's commonly used, mainly in research, is the neutron probe. So you, you um, auger some holes in your, in your fields, you, you monitor those at multiple depths uh, before and after irrigation so you get these moisture profiles. This is another well-established old technique. This is, this is, uh, this is from a paper uh, from uh, Canadian prairies in 1960s, I believe. So this is, gives you so much more. We still use the same technique. Very accurate to around a 60 centimeter radius of the borehole gives you very good numbers for soil moisture, and if you use the depletion approach, you can get a good crop water use technique. But it's expensive, and you can only get episodic measurements, and you can't get um, continuous full season without a lot of effort. Bone ratio. This is a technique, again, that's been around for a long time. A very nice technique. It's an energy balance approach. It, it looks like the technique that we currently use, and I'll describe in more detail, uh, it's a sophisticated weather station that also includes a net radiometer and soil heat flux measurements. You set up a tripod and power supply, and you're measuring essentially these three components. Uh, net radiation, which is primarily your solar radiation coming in, and the soil heat flux, which is this G, and I'll show you uh, what those sensors look like. And then this uh, uh, beta factor, which is a bone ratio, which is just the ratio of of sensible heat to latent heat flux. We want the latent heat flux. And this technique doesn't measure that directly, but backs it out by ratio. So 
It's a moderately cost technique. It's been around for years, pretty reliable, may have a bias. So it's not considered the best possible answer for ET observations. Lysimetry. This is another a gold standard for evapotranspiration transpiration measurement. Obviously not a practical tool for measuring ET in different field locations. But if you have a single experimental site, they can be excellent observations of, of crop fire use. But you have to take a lot of care to make sure whatever you plant inside that box is the same thing outside the box. And so this, this is a, a technique that's been well established by Terry Howe and others in Bush, Texas, and other places around the world. Expensive, very expensive technique, but very good numbers. Uh, weather stations, this is your e sort of econo measurement of ET. Right, so you can measure weather quite inexpensively. You can put on a pole, you can have maybe a tripod with better weather instruments, and then you can apply crop coefficients, which are strictly based on experimental studies such as we do in Maricopa, and then you can get what we call a standardized ET. But these aren't these aren't the evapotranspiration numbers. Uh, that your crop necessarily is doing, it's what a crop under standardized conditions would be used. And that's why the Arizona um, um, MET station network is extremely useful. You, you can take that network, uh, such as the three of them here in, in Yuma Valley, and you can apply crop coefficients. You get a pretty good estimate of how your crop's doing on a daily basis. But again, it's a standardized condition. You have different practices away from the calibration, then it may not be so accurate. And so this is, this is how the uh, a seasonal um, water budget ET uh, value would go. You show that, the, that there's lots of fluctuations on a daily basis, as you can see by the black circles here, and you have these periodic spikes in evaporation due to irrigation events as indicated by the red arrows. So what I'd like to show you is a little bit more detail to take some of the mystery out of the what I call any covariance technique. Uh, we have eight of these stations, about well, seven or eight of them, uh, currently deployed in Yuma, Yuma Valley. This is uh, a major undertaking, and I thank Mazin and others for uh, learning the learning the deployment approach, and uh, doing it efficiently, and moving in and out of the field to accommodate farm practices. Um, the core of the instruments are shown here. On the left-hand side, you can see it's deployed um, with tripod, power, uh, power supplies, solar panels, instruments, and a close-up shown here. Here's the sonic anemometer, which is a sensor for one of the energy balance components, and here's the infrared gas analyzer. The total cost of these stations is around $40,000. Well, this is, this is the mass slide. But I'm, but told I'm not supposed to show, but this is what takes away the mystery of how these stations work. You say, well, it's just a machine, put it out there, press the button, put the data logger, and out comes uh, crop water use at 30 minute intervals. You can do that, but it's best if you know what's going on behind the scenes, and I want to explain some of that. The way this works is that we measure the deviations from the norm. So we have wind blowing at a typical speed, say one or two meters per second, we look at the deviations away from that norm, and we also look at the deviations away from the norm for water vapor density and for temperature density, temperature uh, values, so air temperature, and those are what we call the fluctuations. So this, this technique called Reynolds decomposition is about 100 years old, and it's illustrated here on the, on the white panel here, and it shows you this is U, which is wind speed in the vertical direction, so we decompose the wind speed blowing across your field into horizontal, two horizontal components and a vertical component. We're interested in the vertical transport of water through the field and the vertical transport of heat through your field. So we decompose that into a mean value and a, heat, and a, uh, a transient. And using uh, Reynolds averaging, which I won't go into here, you get the bottom equation, which is fairly legible here in the, in the light. Uh, essentially what we're doing is we're getting a time average estimate of central heat flux and latent heat flux, which is the evapotranspiration, at uh, 30 minute intervals. What do the what do the data look like when you zoom in? Well, these data record at 20 hertz. You're reporting this thing at half hour interval and aggregate them at daily levels. So we want ET at daily time steps. You know, how many millimeters per day? How many inches per day are you getting for the field? 
But we're recording this stuff at 20 hertz. And this is how the data are processed. And it shows you here what's going on in that finest scale detail. If you look at the three different colors, we have wind, which is this blue curve, or the blue dots. Uh, and, the, and then you have the water vapor density with that infrared gas in line is, is the green curve of the green dots, and the temperature is the red. So what this eddy covariance technique does essentially correlates the relationship between the blue and the red for temperature, and the blue and the green for water vapor. So if they vary together, that's the covariance in a positive direction, that means the water vapor is going up. And if, if you have condensation, they would be out of phase. We well, can see here, this is Bermuda grass out of, uh, east of here in the Welton area. The, the wind speed is out of phase with the temperature, which shows that there's heat being sent into the crop and there's water being sent up into the atmosphere. That's how the technique is working. These are the core sensors that go into the eddy covariance technique. Four of them, the net radiometer, which is uh, a simple looking device here that measures long wave and short wave radiation. It's up here, you have these sensors, four of them, for detecting the downwelling and the upwelling radiation. You have soil heat flux plates. Well, these are the most problematic for deployment because uh, they can interfere with field operations. If you go in and cultivate, there are cables in here that will be dug up. But these are essential for closing the energy balance and on how much energy goes into the ground. And then the, the core of the, the energy suite is these two devices that you've seen earlier. This is a sonic anemometer, which measures the wind speed and air temperature uh, in three different directions. And here's the infrared gas analyzer so that has um, a broadband infrared beam that bounces back and forth between here and a chopper motor and it measures water vapor and CO2 at 20 hertz. So here are the components deployed in the field. You have sensors, you have the uh, mounting enclosure, data logger, power supplies, batteries, cell modem, so we can check the operation of it. And the total cost I mentioned is around $40,000. With field operations, just have to be moved in and out uh, to get out of the way for any spray or cultivation activities. Uh, so, it's a major undertaking to collect these data, but it's still considered the best possible observations of crop water use. Uh, so here are some of the data collection procedures. We have to change the memory cards every 10 days, so we have to get in and out of there um, uh, and dodge irrigations. We have uh, two sets of files, a 20 hertz time series, which is enormous, many gigabytes, and we have 30 minute average uh, fluxes. The processing involved, which we do back in the lab, is to merge despite balance the fluxes uh, to create the 30 minute data that Charles showed you earlier. And lastly, we have to merge these data into a continuous time series for the entire season. So, lots of corrections. There's a machine that collects the data, but you a lot of uh, post processing expertise required to get good numbers. Any covariance deployment is a is a significant undertaking. You can't just plop this in any old field. The field has to be big enough to have sufficient what we call fetch. So if, if the wind speed is very high and surface roughness is low, which means you have a smooth crop or smooth soil, you could be measuring effects of evapotranspiration outside of the field that you're interested in. So your measurement height and your surface roughness um, have to be matched for the right field. So ideally you'd have a huge homogeneous field that don't exist. So we try to choose the largest fields we can. We locate so the prevailing wind blows over a, a large part of the field. So say we might cheat a little bit to the north side of the field for predominantly south southerly winds. We normally orient the sonic anemometer to the west so that we, we, we avoid uh, obstructing the wind field measurements uh, from the west, north, and south. So the data look like uh, is shown here on the left-hand side from the data logger software. These are the four components from those four sensors I've shown you. You can see that uh, the blue curve shows you where the irrigation event begins very rapidly. You can also pick that up on the soil moisture sensors that we have with the TDR probes. And this is on the right-hand side shows you how you, you convert these 
these time series into a daily average here and can show the, uh, the wheat of effort transpiration, which is quoted in millimeters per day. But deployments in 2017 are substantial. We've, we've done five major crops in the Yuma area and 16 sites. And I'm not sure you fully appreciate how much work involved in that. We've got a crew of four or more that have to set up these stations, clean these stations, move them out. Uh, all that equipment has to go in and then come out. Maybe if it's spinach, it has to come out in six weeks. Uh, or it might have to move in and out due to spray activities. So we've, we've accomplished uh, all these uh, 16 sites in 2017-2018. We did uh, two locations in 2016. We just started up the project in 2019. We're doing more crops. So now we've looked at romaine, iceberg lettuce, spinach, wheat, uh, sedan grass. Uh, as Charles shown in previous uh, here's here's some of the ET data. See what it looks like on a daily basis, if that is of interest to you. That shows you the effect of um, irrigations and how, how rapidly the the water use uh, decreases over the days of the spikes here. And then in the aggregate, if you're looking at seasonal water use for the different sites. And the slope shows you the deviations from the norm, so it aggregates that and shows, for, at least for lettuce, that we're getting around 200, in this case 250, 240, as low as 206 millimeters entire seasonal water use for these different sites. Uh, very consistent numbers on total EP. Uh, for wheat, uh, the pattern is different. Of course, the season is warmer for, for when you end with a wheat crop, so you'll have higher rapid evapotranspiration, and now we're up to around 500 to 650 uh, millimeters for seasonal crop water use. This is showing two sites, and we have more sites uh, that are not fully analyzed, so I won't present them today. Uh, large aperture similometry. Uh, so one of the shortcomings of the, the eddy covariance technique, even though we consider that the best, is that it's very specific, particular field. And if we're interested in more regional analysis, and if we're interested in bridging the gap between measurements at a points, point location and a satellite observation, which is where we're headed with this technique, we need, we need techniques that, that scale larger distances. And the LAS, what we call the LAS system, is such a technique. Um, currently, uh, they're, they're mounted on Smith Farm, and they'll they may be located over Citrus in the next year or so. I'm not sure of the timing of that. Uh, this is the this is an illustration of it. They have two sensors. One's a transmitter, and one's a receiver for an infrared beam. And the transect is shown here um, along these two transects here, and then underneath it we have eddy covariance stations to validate the observations. Ordinarily, you wouldn't need that validation data. So, how do these techniques work? Well, they're completely, almost completely different from the eddy covariance technique. That they use what's called structure functions, which I won't go into detail, but I list for your <laughs> appreciation. We measure this. We measure this number that's called CN squared, which is the sort of the effective turbulence of the atmosphere across the transect that we measure with that infrared beam. And we convert that into a temperature turbulence term here, and then we convert that in terms of sensible heat flux, which is uh, the amount of temperature energy coming out of the soil. And lastly, we convert that into uh, evapotranspiration by subtracting by residual from the net radiation. So a daily curve, the data from these stations looks like this. Um, shows you that it has strong transitions at sunrise and sunset, and then during the day it's nearly constant. Well, the next speaker will, will delve into more detail about uh, remote sensing, but let me, let me point you where we're headed. So we obviously have put a lot of effort into getting a baseline crop water use for Yuma. Because those numbers badly needed to be updated. And we're confirming in many cases the very high water use efficiencies applied locally. Uh, but we can't use those techniques on an ongoing basis. They're too expensive and impractical uh, for continuous use. Yeah, weather stations, that's fine. But for eddy covariance, no, we can't do that. So we're looking for remote sensing. Well. <coughs> There's really a revolution going on right now in satellite technology with CubeSats. I mean, it used to be that you just have one satellite that go over every 16 days, and if it's cloudy, you've got nothing for a month. And so to, to promise farmers and irrigators and water managers 
a water planning tool for mode sensing was was not at all credible. You couldn't possibly get the observations you needed to make your decisions. But with CubeSats, we're now having observations every day or every other day. If the weather's cloudy, of course, you still don't get it. But now you're very likely to be able to get observations uh, weekly or better in the visible near infrared and potentially in the thermal infrared. And if you have both of those, you'll be able to solve the energy balance the way we've been doing on the eddy covariance. These are some of the observations that are uh, possible now from the satellites. I list them here. Here we go. And what we hope to get, this is an older slide of mine, but this, the concept is the same. Ultimately, we want to be able to get a map such as this is from central Oklahoma, where we just have a daily evapotranspiration map based on remote sensing and calibrated based on local observations that we take a great deal of effort to collect. In addition, we would be able to use the, those daily maps and climatological data and model forecasts and crop models to give you 10-day um, estimates of crop water use. So that would be very useful if you had a tool, at least um, a simplified tool to give you an estimate what's the likely water use that you're going to have in the next week, or water requirement you're going to have in the next week, and what also, more importantly, what's the uncertainty of that? Because sometimes we don't know, so very, we don't know what we don't know, right? So if there's been bad weather or there's been a lot of uncertainty, we provide that number too. So we have a mean value that figures out how much the water use we think you'll need to order and then a second number with the variable bounds is indicated on the curve on the right. Uh, very recently, uh, in the last year, we uh, NASA launched EcoStress, which is a thermal infrared satellite on the space station. Uh, and, and a couple of us are on the science team for that satellite. Uh, this collects thermal infrared data at 60 meter resolution, not the best resolution for farms, but still. Uh, the best possible we can get right now. This is an illustration over Yuma from the end of September. And so, so it's, the resolution is good enough to pick up all the center pivots here. Here's, here's the U.S.-Mexico boundary down here. Here's Interstate 8. And here are the mountains as you come in off of the interstate. So you get an appreciation of the kind of temperature resolution. Those temperatures can be used in energy balance models similar to what I showed you and the 80 covariance to get a daily evapotranspiration estimate. Uh, perhaps more compelling is the uh, high-resolution visible near-infrared data now being provided by the French-Israeli project called Venus. Venus data are freely available. This is an example of the tile. Now, courtesy of, of CNES, CNES, which is the French agency providing these data, uh, they they moved uh, an acquisition directly over Yuma last November. We are now getting, over Yuma area, every other day, images such as these. You can just appreciate what they look like. Here is the multispectral data, um, zooming in. So this is, this is over where the Bureau of Reclamation facility here is. Here are fields between it and the uh, University Ag Center. The resolution is five meters. You can do a tremendous amount of uh, within field monitoring of crop density with data such as these. And the latency of these data is very low. It's around three or four days. These are freely available. Anybody now can go get them. Uh, the project doesn't go forever. It'll go for another year and a half. But to me, this is showing where the technology is going. We're doing the, the ground observations to validate the actual crop water use for developing techniques for remote sensing to provide you with the information on what water use is uh, happening now uh, within the field scale and also the tools to, to model, model crop water use over a period of about a week. Uh, 2019 to 21 plans, if, if we are fortunate we uh, funded that long, we're going to look at these following crops here, broccoli, cauliflower, celery, cotton, uh, cotton's definitely in the bag for this year for a comparison between the short season and, uh, and long season crop up in Maricopa, uh, baby leaf, citrus, and alfalfa. Uh, and just to repeat where we've been and where we're going, 
Uh, we've spent three years, uh, very intense years, to develop baseline water use. We'll be publishing those numbers. I'm not presenting them all today because we want to get them through peer review. But we've been deploying eight eddy covariate stations and two LAS stations um, to retrieve those numbers. I wanted to give you a full appreciation of the technology required to make that happen, not a trivial effort. Uh, and where we're headed, which is integrate the ground observations to spaceborne evapotranspiration. Thanks. Yes, sir. Um, I use the Leonard Erie stuff since I, I worked with him back in the 50s. Uh, is there a significant difference or a percentage that I should add to water the figures that he produced for teaching purposes of kids on, on uh, scheduling water, water, water use, things like that? Or can I just use what I've got until we have some new curves? Well, they're, they're, di they're different data sets. So, Leonard Aries data is, is averaged over multiple years and then smoothed with French curves. I know he used French curves. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we all remember what a French curve is. And so those are useful for average water use. Correct. But then if you want to teach uh, students about how the best possible way to measure water use, then you can discuss the micrometeorological observations that we do nowadays, which is a different technique that gives you daily or hourly water use observations. It was not possible from Leonard Urey's data. I understand that, sir. I, I guess it's just the minutia of it on a day-to-day -day basis. If you're, if you're just trying to teach somebody how to understand evapotranspiration and water use and consumptive use, all of the things related to irrigation water management and how much water to apply and stuff like that. Um, that kind of detail is, is, is probably not going to be used on a daily basis. It's going to be used to establish a, a certain type of a program that you can use. I just didn't want to mislead. I'll, I'll tell them, of course, that there's no more going on, but, you know. Well, I mean, my point is this. It's like, those numbers are good. I mean, he did, he did some excellent work. I don't want to diminish that. Okay. But, the, but the time and spatial resolution for those days isn't there. Sure. And now you've got these techniques that give you the details you could never see. So now you know the day-to-day -day basis. You know how the, the evapotranspiration changes on an hourly basis. You couldn't do that with it. So, so to me, they're different worlds. Um, and if you're if you're managing with a deficit, you couldn't do that with Leonard Erie's data. So I, it's just um, it, it's hard to compare the two. Okay, I, I understand that, but in a practical world, we can't react fast enough to really change anything. You know, we're we're locked into certain practices and schedules and various things like that. So I will I will look for the. Well, I, I, well, okay, so this is an interesting point, and I'm not being, not being a farmer, but I mean, so I just had a discussion with a colleague in um, our lab in Maricopa on a, on a related, a different topic about uh, plant variety selection, and she told me, she says, look, we don't want all those details, we just want an average, and it, and it kind of drives me crazy because, like, you guys say you want averages. But the techniques are so much better now that you should start thinking about how you can use the better data. Now, right? because you didn't have it, you didn't use it, and you say you can't use it. Well, okay, I know, I understand how irrigation water you have to order it several days in advance, and you can't fine tune it. What I'm saying is, you have new opportunities to manage your water in better ways uh, you couldn't do before. Now, if you can't take advantage of the detail, I, I do understand that. But, but, I, but these new techniques provide you new knowledge about where your water is going that you never knew before. And, and that's the message. Is if, uh, you can take it from there. So. Um, with the uh, data you're collecting for the different crops, I assume you're reevaluating crop coefficients. Are you seeing any differences, say, from lettuce, or, you know, compared to the past? 
assumptions of the coefficients for some of these different commodities? Well, uh, the answer is we don't know yet. Uh, I think you know Charles' comment with with lettuce. I think we've we've had that nailed for a while pretty well. Uh, I don't know about wheat if we're on target. Focus has not been on the crop coefficient comparison yet, but we'll do that. We're definitely doing that with the Zenita satellite data, and we'll let you know in a year. We're not there yet. Good morning. Good morning. So my name is Pierre Gevic. I'm with the University of Maryland, and I support uh, NASA research and the uh, project. So I'm going to present you uh, a project that uh, we started with Andy and, and Charles and uh, focused on the use of satellite imagery and, uh, and field uh, measurements to, uh, to manage agricultural water management. So NASA is developing building, sending space and uh, maintaining a lot of satellites. And this is a summary of all the Earth observation satellites that are currently in space. So each satellite initially was dedicated for a specific uh, topic to uh, look at clouds, land, or precipitation. But NASA now collecting a lot of data and wants to, uh, to promote the, uh, the work and the, uh, and the systems and to apply the data to new, uh, new topics. So NASA is funding now what they call applied science uh, programs for a specific application, like for example, agriculture, can we use all the satellites to maybe uh, improve uh, ag practice? That's the goal. So, <clears throat> for agriculture, my motivation uh, started around 12 years ago with this uh, this curve, the pink one, that should present the evolution of the price of wheat at the global scale. And you can see that the uh, two price hikes in 2008 and 2010 that uh, made the price jump significantly because of uh, drought, severe drought events in uh, <coughs> in Australia in 2008 and Ukraine and in in Russia in uh, and uh, in the US in 2011. And 2012. <coughs> so seeing those uh, effects. Scientists at NASA and UMB so that, well, if we have a global observation and if we can detect these drought events and inform the society, maybe we can we can uh, influence the uh, the markets and uh, and uh, manage to uh, to reduce the pro uh, food price volatility. So the initial goal was uh, was there and. Uh, and for that, scientists at NASA started to, uh, to look at uh, observation data. They accumulated 20 uh, plus years of, of data, 12 years at this time. So the, this is an image in 2012. And uh, so with 20 years of data, you can have a good idea of the uh, average cycle. <clears throat> so what would be the response of a crop or vegetation on average? And using the current observation, and the departure from the average can give you a good estimate of uh, a possible problem. And uh, in that case, it was drought in the US, drought in, uh, in Europe and, uh, and Ukraine. And the, uh, the analysis used here is the NDVI, it's a combination of visible and infrared data, so very simple to uh, mm -hmm. process. So based on such information, today more than 300 members of 30 plus countries are using uh, this information and, um, and meet every month to discuss the satellite project and reach a consensus on the uh, global uh, food conditions to uh, try to manage uh, food security and uh, market price. So this project is part of the GeoGlam initiative. <clears throat> so based on uh, this success, NASA wants to extend now the application to, uh, to not only the global scale but also look at local, local application and, uh, and help 
uh, uh, more the, uh, the farmers and not only the, uh, the governments or the, uh, the big markets company. <coughs> and uh, so they, they funded a project that I am leading and uh, Andy and, and Charles are part of it. They are uh, <coughs> co investigators of the project to uh, follow the uh, crop health but also try to detect uh, environmental stress, for example, water, and maybe try to detect the stress before it affects the plant, and, uh, and develop models, improve uh, observation to, uh, to a better management and yield forecasting of the land. <coughs> so the project is funded by the National Water Resource Program. So the goal is to use all the available satellites uh, U.S. and European to improve uh, agricultural water management. So there are more than 30 partners in the project in four different countries, mainly the U.S., four different sites. Here, and one is located at Cuba, based on work that uh, Andes and Chart are, are doing. One is South Africa, one in Argentina, and uh, the site in Tanzania. <coughs> So in the project, we try to uh, use all the available information about about the crops. So we have uh, so what Sean and Andy show you it's the the field scale so where, where you have the knowledge of your fields and your practice and uh, and your crop, and there you can install station and really measure accuracy uh, parameters of interest for you. So the farm scale, more and more the drone uh, are, are developed, and then drone can, can map uh, parameters through, uh, through large farms, and you can study the viability within the field or between, between fields, so very promising techniques. And you have the satellites, so more and more satellites uh, today available, uh, more and more commercial also, also uh, options at very high resolution. But the more you are far from the surface, the more dilute the information is, so the more uncertainties you have in the, in the satellite project. So the, uh, the goal of our, our project is to, uh, to combine all this information and new techniques. So one of the new uh, techniques we like to, uh, to use and the end is introduce eco-stress, so it's based on the thermal infrared observation. <coughs> <clears throat> so when the plant is uh, subject to stress, we close its uh, stomata to reduce evaporation and then increase temperature. And with a uh, thermal infrared instrument, we can measure the uh, change in temperature. So this is an, uh, an example. <coughs> so this is an airborne flight to <coughs> the JPL plane. I was in the plane over a vineyard in California. <coughs> so this is this is a vineyard, and this is the temperature measured in July. It's a two meter resolution, and this is the yield collected by a gallo wine at the end of the season in September. And, and you can you can see that there is some very nice correlation between the red and the brown, so the hot area and low yield, and the blue and the green, so the, the coolest area, so where uh, water stress is less, and the and the green. And this is what one date only in July. So we think that if we can uh, use this kind of information before enough uh, the hours, maybe we can uh, provide information for action on the field. In that case, it was due to soil characteristics and problem with the uh, irrigation system. So if I put the uh, farmer or grower can use this information before maybe can 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 act. And in this case, they are. They are improving their irrigation system. So, thermal infrared is so what we uh, we want to uh, to explore. It's not easy to, to see uh, with real data. Is should provide information before the the plants start to die. So, in visible infrared, you can detect a change when the plants from, switch from green to yellow or brown. So, start dying. In, in, in thermal infrared, you can detect maybe change when plants start to close its uh, stomata. So here, an, an example, 
using Landsat imagery. So on the left is the leaf index, vegetation density derived using visible and infrared information. On the right is evapotranspiration derived using thermal infrared. I selected the two, two sites, I don't know if you can see them, it's here and here. So in the visible bands, the two sites look the same. And they are they the same level of green, so the same vegetation density. But in the thermal infrared, you can see they are totally different. And uh, in that case, maybe one can be irrigated, or the other one no, or one system, the irrigation system for, for this one can, can uh, was not maybe working properly at this time. So, but at least you can detect a possible problem before a change in, uh, in, the, in the plant. So how we try to uh, gather all this information at different uh, resolution? <coughs> so we have uh, the heart of the, of the system is a crop model. Yeah. That is simulating the carbon, water, and nitrogen cycles and uh, simulate the growth of the plant. But this kind of model needs a lot of information to, to run. So you have uh, a lot of information we need to run this kind of model. So for example, the model needs a lot of uh, data regarding management, irrigation, fertilization, a lot of also uh, dating, and uh, needs some uh, weather information and soil characteristics and the surface types if you want to, to scale the, uh, the approach. So if um, uh, so, we work with um, with growers and farmers to get those information to be able to calibrate. The, the model. So the calibration process is we tweak, tweak, tune, we adjust the model to try to represent the truth. So we use satellite information, ground-based measurements, speed up the model, iterate and find a uh, good calibration coefficient. When the model uh, represents enough well the, uh, the truth, so you do, users can use it avoiding all this big machine behind. So this has been done. It's transparent for the users. So the users just have uh, scenarios of different management, and you have the input of the of the model. So in that case, if the satellite is able to give you a current condition of your crop, then if you need action, you can uh, design different scenarios. You can you can think about different possibilities uh, to uh, to apply and run the system with all your scenario and see the impact on the production. And the, uh, the model also includes an economic and environmental part, so you can, you can manage uh, to, um, to keep the yield, but also optimize, optimize the environmental and, uh, and uh, uh, profit uh, aspect. So that's what we, um, what we, we, are, we would like to uh, we like to do and we like to do uh, online in an interactive system so you can you can directly modify what you want, push a button and and the, uh, the model is running or someone at UND is running the model for you. So this is an example of a uh, result from the project. So the, um, the goal here for Argentina, so it's an um, irrigation district in, in La Pampa, is to uh, better manage Expansion of expansion of irrigation and better manage uh, water allocation. So this is Landsat imagery collected in 2015 on the left, 16. You can see that you have new new fields uh, every every year, and this this imagery can uh, can provide good good information about the, the water use at the the local scale. So the fields there are, are big pivot center, so 500 yards radius, and the farmers were very interesting to, uh, to this kind of information, showing that there is something maybe wrong in those sites, in that case it was different soil properties, and the action was to adjust the uh, irrigation system for the different part of the, of the field, the big part. This is results in, uh, in New Zealand. So I spent a year in New Zealand last year. I was working with a, a consulting company that is providing irrigation information to farmers. So in New Zealand, there is a lot of uh, big milk, milk industry, so a lot of pressure. 
a lot of rain as well, but not homogeneously distributed through the year on the country. So a lot of irrigation. In that case, they are irrigating more as every day. <coughs> so to manage irrigation, they, uh, they use soil moisture probe. And this company especially use soil moisture probe. And they, uh, they install one probe per field. So the fields can be sometimes very large, so 200 plus acres, and they just have one point measurements to manage uh, soil moisture and then provide information for, for irrigation. So late 2017, early 2019, they couldn't detect with their, their probe, they couldn't detect uh, uh, soil moisture deficit which had a significant impact in the, uh, in the profit. So we, uh, we tested some satellite solution. In that case, we tested a, a daily product at coarser resolution than what Andy showed you, but at least you can, we can have, we could have a daily product. And the satellite was able to find a trend right in the, uh, in the, uh, in the water, stress, uh, water stress curve. So to uh, promote satellite products and, uh, and facilitate the use of satellite products, we are developing a website, interactive. So it's a project website, so it's mainly focused on the, uh, the partners, so the sites that are defined, the seven sites define the project. So the address is, uh, is there. So what we... Uh, what to provide is a, a near real time access to all the uh, satellite data that are of interest for uh, the users. So in that case, for Lima, we presented the Landsat, uh, Landsat NDVI, so combination of visible and near infrared information. And, uh, and the system is not efficient like Google Earth, but what we try to do is be able to zoom different part of, of the map and, and see specific specific field. So this is what we, uh, we like to do. So I don't know if you see, but you can select the sites, you can select the product you want. So here, so in DVI, there is a water stress index, temperature, and you can select the date. So we uh, By selecting different data, you can you can see differences in the field. You can check differences between fields and uh, and different products. So here is the associated water stress index. So it's the ratio between the upper transformation and the potential potentiality. So it's based on thermal infrared data and on Landsat thermal infrared data is is that relatively coarse resolution. So the um, Pixelization is not the same that is easier. But we believe can provide useful information for, for relatively large, large scale. For small, small ones, it's not, probably not useful. And, uh, and what, we, uh, what we are doing is to try to engage and uh, communicate with, with uh, our partners and users. So this is a visit I did in Argentina. To meet the farmers, to first identify the needs. Uh, I'm not a farmer, I'm a remote sensing scientist. So most of the time, uh, uh, I am far from the surface. But we need, we need your knowledge to uh, to maybe uh, define and, and develop the best the best product for for your application. And I met with uh, irrigation districts, so water agencies, to uh, to discuss their plan in the future, how they plan to manage uh, irrigation and expansion in, uh, in irrigation, allocation of water, and, uh, and visited the field to, uh, to discuss with the, uh, the local scientists and the, uh, and the users. So this, uh, this project is, uh, is open. So we uh, really need information from, from the field, so from, from you. We, we cannot provide good uh, 
good results without sample information in irrigation or, or management. And uh, so if you are interested in, in being part of, part of it, you are welcome to, to contact me. And, uh, and we, can, uh, we can discuss about your specific uh, goals, specific issues, and maybe try to see if there is a one, uh, one product that could, uh, could meet your, uh, your needs. Thank you. Any questions, guys? So the data that's available are for those specific sites, not just anywhere in the country? Uh, not yet. So it's a, it's a research project. So we try to define and validate the tools for seven sites. If we are successful, maybe the next step will be uh, to scale and to launch. But for now, it's seven sites that we can add, we can easily add new sites. That's, but having global coverage, routinely every day, is very heavy, and it's not, it's not the goal in this project. More question? What? In the Yuma tile that you have, Will I be able to access, uh, download the image, or is it only, you know, if you subscribe to it, or are there some? Mm -hmm. So on the website, no, you cannot uh, now, but maybe we can easily add it. We cannot download the data, but if you need the data, we can we can send the data to you. No, no, I'm just curious whether anybody here can they go and access that particular or any any part of that image from the human file. It still isn't. So this is an example I wanted to show you about the capability. So that my, that's my first visit in, uh, in Yuma. So I wanted to show <coughs> the and to show you. Uh, for that, if, uh, if, you, if you are interested in the project and you don't want to, uh, to share publicly information about your crops, everything can be uh, private, you can have a password to access privately. If you want the data, you can access all the data you, you want. So NASA is public uh, data, so everything will be available. Uh, if you're interested in the crop model, you can also think about installing crop model in your computer if you want. But we try to develop a tool to facilitate the, the work and the use of data. So, so uh, each satellite data is provided with a different format. So if you want to use a lot of them, you need to do a lot of them more. So with this kind of tools, you try to put everything same resolution, everything visual. And, uh, but if you want the raw data, we can. But that's something interesting. We should, should have an option to put down the data. Our last speaker <coughs> today is Dr. Clinton Williams. We're going to kind of shift gears now. <laughs> and go from evapotranspiration to water reuse. And my presentation is going to be very much an overview of sort of, I think it's important for people who are going to receive the water. And you'll find out that whether you think you're getting reused water or not, you're getting reused water. That when you receive this water, it's important to know what processes have gone, processes have gone into the water so that you can know what might be problems, what might, might be things that are good in the water that you can, that you can use. So, to start with, I'd like to show this, this picture. So, this is, a, this is from the National Academy of Sciences, and it simply shows that in the black line, the black line is U.S. water use, total water use, that's ag, urban, everything. The red line is population, and the blue line is per capita water use. And what you notice there is until about 19... The early 1980s, water use was going up with population. In the mid, in, in the in the 80s, things started to happen. Our per capita water use started to go down. And in essence, if you look at this, when everyone says that we don't conserve water, we're doing a pretty good job. This is all efficiencies. We're bringing more efficiencies into the water system. We're not losing as much water. We're not using as much water. But eventually, who knows how long this will continue to go? At some point. All the efficiencies are going to be ringed out, and we're going to have to start, the, the, our, our per capita water use will begin to go up, or at least our total water use will start to go up, because the efficiencies have been taken out. And one of the ways that we can fix that 
is reuse. And this is where I want to point out that whether you think you're getting reused water or not, you are. Because if you had something to drink today, that water's been through someone or something before. <laughs> and if you look at this figure, it shows that whether it's upstream from you and you're taking water out of the river, or you're getting water directly from a sewer treatment plant, all the water's reused. So it's important to understand sort of what goes into that reuse. For, for you here, for the most part, if you're getting Colorado River water, it's Las Vegas. You're getting a lot of the stuff that's come out of Las Vegas' the sewer treatment plant. But this has been going on for a long time. This is a picture in 1908 from near my family, my great-grandfather's farm, where they used direct sewage water. So we've been, we've been reusing water for a long time. So to get that, to, to, to help you, in essence, a sewer treatment plant is nothing other than a managed system where we use nature to, to treat the water. We manage it and we, ma ma and we maximize those natural processes. The first one that sewer treatment plants want to use is the reason sewer treatment plants came about to begin with was to remove carbon. This is the carbon cycle, and just to know that what's happening in that sewer treatment plant is you're trying to remove carbon. You'll sometimes hear that talked about as BOD, so biochemical oxygen, or total organic carbon. And that's what it's there to do, is simply to remove carbon. We're taking carbon that's in sugars and whatever is a fixed source. Microbes are taking it, they're turning it into carbon dioxide, or they're turning it into part of their own, their, their, their bodies. The other thing we worry about is nitrogen. Unfortunately for farmers, <coughs> sewer treatment plants have to remove nitrogen. You'd like that nitrogen. It'd be really nice if we had sewer treatment plants that could simply say, today a farmer's going to get this water, turn off the denitrification. We're going to send it over to them. The next day it's going to go into the river, we've got to turn the denitrification back on because nitrogen is bad for people. Nitrate specifically for babies. You get a thing called metahemoglobinemia, which in essence, takes nitrate, turns it into nitrite in your stomach, and it binds to hemoglobin, so the hemoglobin is no longer useful. Now the only way you can get oxygen to supply the rest of your tissues is to make new hemoglobin. It takes a long time. <coughs> so, to start with, to understand this, these are some of the treatment methods. <coughs> Stabilization ponds. This is the oldest method available. Mm -hmm. You simply take the water, you collect it in a pond, you let it sit there for a while, and if some of the solids settle out, you move, remove some of the carbon, nitrogen a little bit, depending if you have anaerobic and aerobic zones. But one thing for you to realize is that this is typically the treatment method that like a dairy or a, or a cattle <coughs> operation is going to use. A fine feeding operation, they're going to collect the water in a pond, they're going to let the solids settle out, they're going to figure out some place to send the water. This is going to have you know, lots of nitrogen, that sort of thing. And then they're going to clear out the manure and probably spread it on a field for, for, as fertilizer. You have facultative ponds. These are ponds that are a little bit deeper than And you actually set up zones to try and make them to, to, to maximize what they do. You get algae growth in the top. You get anaerobic in the bottom. You have aerobic zones and anaerobic zones to try and do some denitrification and sort of make this process go a little bit better. So... This sort of said, it talks about you have these upper aerobic zones, CO2 and uh, sunlight takes a lot of the inorganic nutrients out, nitrogen, things like that, phosphorus, and then they're going to settle to the bottom. This is what one looks like. You know, they're just, a zone that they don't smell very good, but they're out there. <laughs> then you have a, a facultative pond, can be influenced by things like sunlight and temperature and pH. <coughs> biological activity. Like in Yuma, one of the things that's going to happen if you are getting water, say, from a dairy, they're going to have one of these kind of ponds to hold their water. The nitrogen is going to change depending on it, if it's summer or winter. Because in the summertime, it's really hot, there's not a lot of dissolved or oxygen, things are going to grow faster, the nitrogen is going to be denitrified because oxygen is going to not be present. Whereas in the wintertime, all of a sudden now, you might start getting more nitrogen. That's important to know if you're receiving water from this source. Because if you're in a situation like if you grow wine grapes, you want to control that nitrogen 
exactly. And if you start eating nitrogen from a source you're not expecting, that can throw off your entire cultural practice. Typically, the retention time of these is about three to six months. You have systemic solids and VOD removal, some nitrogen removal, phosphorus removal, removal, and pathogen. The thing about pathogens is, you think 99% pathogen removal, that's pretty good. But really, it's not, because it doesn't take only one pathogen to make something sick. So these aren't, these aren't expected for pathogen removal. Then you have aerated lagoons. In essence, you're managing that same lagoon a little bit better. This is what it looks like. You start to add some oxygen, you kind of circulate water around, and what that whole thing is is to try and speed things up. Anaerobic reactions are slow, Aerob aerobic actions are, operations are fast. In these, the other thing that you have an advantage is a much lower retention time, about 10 days. So you don't have to have nearly as big a pond. You get suspended solids and VOD removal, some nitrogen removal, not nearly as much. The reason is because nitrogen removal happens in aerobic situations, not anaerobic situations, or in anaerobic situations, not aerobic situations. Some phosphorus removal and pathogens, again, 20 to 95%. You can't depend on that for pathogen removal. <coughs> so then we move from sort of these semi-managed to just kind of a place out there to a real treatment plan. This is kind of what a diagram looks like. You bring the water into the head. And if you've ever been to a sewer treatment plant, the only place it smells is this place right here. All the rest doesn't smell. It's not like you expect sewage to be. You're going to run through some sort of biochemical processes. You're going to run through, through clarification to try and separate solids from liquid. You're going to do some sort of disinfection, so then you can release the water. And then the other thing that's important, especially for farmers too, is solids handling. That's the biosolids. Those are the things that come out the bottom, they're settled out, and oftentimes these are land applied. This is where you're going to find things like heavy metals, some pathogens. This is where you're going to find more pathogens. And then this is where like, things like nitrate and are going to end up. So the first thing that they came up with tr were trickling filters. All you, sent, all you did was you took, you've probably seen these, they're big round. You have these arms that spin around in a circle and deliver water. And all it's doing is this. You're running water down through this, this tall trickling filter. They're 10 to 12 feet tall. You run water down through it. You start to do Bacteria grow on these, this substrate, whether it's rocks or plastic, whatever it is. And those, those bacteria grow, they take out nutrients from the solution. Eventually those films get so big, they fall off, they come down to the bottom. And then, so you're, you're taking your nutrients and put them into a, a microbe that's now kind of fixed and the water's going to move on beyond it. Choking the filter processes again, they're going to remove some phosphate. Not a lot of nitrogen because it's aerobic. And you're going to get a significant amount of carbon reduction. Because the carbon is taken out of the water and now it's going to be in what you settle out when you clarify the water. You have oxidation ditches. This is where you get nitrogen removal. If you look here, you'll notice that there are places that look kind of quiescent and, and places that are quite bubbly. And that's because you're adding oxygen. You're just pumping air into the system. Where you pump air in, it goes aerobic, so anything that's ammonia turns into nitrate. And then as soon as it goes very rapidly after it goes, so you're not adding any oxygen, the microbes are working so hard, you use up all the oxygen, it turns anaerobic, and then you get denitrification. This is denitrification. In essence, you take nitrate, go to nitrite, then eventually you get to nitrous oxide and into gas. A lot of times, a lot of times farmers will try and stop this process. You don't want to stop it here or beyond because this, pro this compound is poisonous. That's what causes metahuman globinemia in babies. It's also all of nature thinks this is poisonous. Therefore, everyone has ways to really take it. If you get any of this form, it's going to rapidly take it on. What you want to do, though, is you'll get, you've heard of nitrification inhibitors. They'll put those right here. They stop this process so that it all stops as nitrate and doesn't go on to nitrite. And if one disadvantage to nitrate is, in soil it's mobile. So you add too much water and it's going to leach beyond your root zone, you're not going to get any more. So 
So that's what the oxidation is just, it's all about managing that process. So you get good removal of suspended solids, BOD. You can get really good removal of nitrogen. So if you're upstream from a sewer treatment plant that's putting water in a river and they denitrify, your nitrogen is going to stay fairly constant. You're going to have, it's going to be below 10 parts per million because that's everyone's permit. You get a little bit of phosphate re removal. Uh, you'll get viruses and protozoa, some removal of those. The next thing is we're now going to take, we've now taken, we've treated all the stuff that's dissolved, but now we've got to get rid of all the bugs that brew, the microbes, we call it flock. So you'll either use dissolved air flotation, which is really rapid and fast. You put little bubbles in, I'll show you here. You put bubbles in, you float things to the top, and you skim them off the top, which is kind of opposite of what you'd think. We've got water, most of these things are going to sink, but to sink takes a long time. If you put a bubble and hook a bubble onto them, it goes real fast. And this is what it looks like. It's kind of gross. <laughs> What's amazing is this is actually dissolved air flotation in a drinking water supply. So that was what was in the drinking water supply that's coming out using dissolved air flotation. Or you have a clarifier. And the clarifier is one where we do the opposite of, instead of floating at the top, the top of bubbles, we let it go really quiet for a long time and we let it sink. That's what a clarifier looks like, where we're taking the, 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 the clarified water off the top. This is a schematic. They have a really big, wide pipe. The water comes in at the bottom and flows up really, really slow so that the heavier things can fall out the bottom. We skim the stuff off the bottom, and that then becomes the solids, and the fresh water comes, uh, the, the clarified water comes off the top. Then one thing that's really important for here in Yuma, at least, is disinfection. If you're going to get treated wastewater, you want to make sure there's no pathogens in it. And that's going to be something like UV light. If they're providing you with UV light disinfection, as a farmer, you probably want to say, you know what, I don't want UV light disinfected. Because anything that still makes it through that UV light is still alive and can grow along. If it goes through the water for a long time, there's no there's no like residual disinfection. It disinfects it with UV light. Beyond that, there's no more disinfection. If you can disinfect your farm with UV light, it's okay because there's not a lot of time before it then gets onto the field. What you'd want is something like chlorine. Sometimes they'll do ozone, but ozone is another one of those things. You put in ozone, it does its thing. But there's no residual. It just immediately is gone. Chlorine, it sticks around for a while. In fact, when you have a drinking water supply, especially here in Arizona where it's hot, and you take the water out of your tap and you're like, wow, this really smells chlorine-y. There's a reason for that. There has to be enough chlorine left in the water from the time it leaves the, the plant that treats the drinking water until it gets to the very last house. So if there's an intrusion into the pipe between there and there, it can kill it. So if you want to get rid of that chlorine smell, that clean flavor in your tap water. Fill a pitcher, a cup, just let it sit. You'll notice bubbles will start to form in it. That's the chlorine outgassing. So the last thing is solids removal, and here's solids removal. Solids treatment is right here, usually it's anaerobic digestion, because a lot of the pathogens are going to end up in there. You're going to anaerobically, anaerobically digest it for a while. It's going to kill all those pathogens. And then you'll have like this solid material that then that's what biosolids that get put on your field. And typically, pathogens are all killed within that. You know, it's like 99.99999% pathogen removal because all of our pathogens are, for the most part, aerobic pathogens. They, they like, like oxygen. If you can take oxygen away from them, then those anaerobic pathogens, or those anaerobic microbes, that grow slowly, but they're really tenacious, and they eat up all those pathogens. So this is what it looks like. You'll hear sometimes talk about primary treatment, secondary treatment, tertiary treatment. Those are all things that you need to understand what they mean. Primary means they've removed carbon. They've lowered that DOD. That's what makes when they take sewage water and you know, put it into a river, you know, it starts to kind of smell, gets hydrogen sulfide smell. That's because there's a lot of carbon. A lot of microbes can eat that carbon, it's readily available. 
turns anaerobic, you start any sulfur gets turned, in, turned into hydrogen sulfide, and that's what causes the problem. So primary treatment, it's carbon removal. Secondary treatment, they start talking about secondary treatment. That means they've done something like remove nitrogen. Or more frequently now, they're doing some sort of process to remove phosphorus. So that's removing sort of these secondary things that are an environmental problem, but really for a farmer, they're not that. You actually like to have that phosphorus, like to have that nitrogen. And then if they talk about tertiary, that means they've gone one more step. They've polished this, the water a little bit better. Or now they'll start talking about advanced. So those are the things to think about. If they start talking about prior, it's been primary treated, you know carbon's been removed. If they say it's been secondary treated, then you know that you've had something like nitrogen, probably nitrogen removed. If they talk about tertiary, then there's been advanced treatment done. It's been filtered again or something's happened. So one thing about treatment is nothing happens to salt. Salt stays. There are some ways, I'll talk about it in a little bit, that you can get rid of salt, but for the most part, salt stays around. So what do sewer treatment plants look like as far as that salt? So we have salinity. Salinity, the problem with that is it has an osmotic potential, causes problems in, in plants, mostly osmotic problems. The plant can't overcome, can't bring the water in, and there's too much salt. So you get yield reduction, and this is a pretty well-documented phenomenon we know about what happens with if you add so much salt we have Moss Hoffman curves that will tell you up to a certain amount of salt no yield reduction you go past that point and you start giving yield reduction and you can look those up the other problem with salt and especially from sewer treatment plants is sodicity this isn't a, this isn't a plant problem for the most part sodicity is more a soil problem that's when the balance of sodium monovalent ions to divalent ions like ions like calcium and magnesium get out of balance. And that causes the soil to disperse. You don't get infiltration, you get aerobic. Like the roots start to die because they can't get enough oxygen. The water doesn't move through the soil very easily. And if you have sodic problems in your soil, they're really hard to get rid of. Because the only way to get rid of a sodic problem is first you have to take that sodic soil and turn it into a saline soil and then leach out the, the salts. So here, I don't know if many of you have seen this, this is a table that's been around for a long time. This is Handbook 60 from the USDA in the 50s, and then in the 70s, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, they did uh, FAO Publication 29. And both of those, if you want to find them, are online PDF versions, and you can download them, and you get all the tables and everything that are there. That are there. That's FAO 29 and the Handbook 60 from USDA. And it shows that as SAR goes up, so the, that imbalance of sodium to calcium gets higher, you can have more and more saline waters for you not to have these soil problems. And that's kind of important. I'll show you in, in a minute with some really high quality water, some problems you can run into. So here's actual data from the sewer treatment plant. This is a sewer treatment plant in Arizona. Sample in winter, spring, summer, and fall. And all these were sampled for a whole week. We sampled every 15 minutes. We composited a two-hour sample, took that sample, and measured it. So we wanted to see what sort of things were in that sewage effluent. And one of the things you can see is that in winter, if you look here in winter, the EC, so the, or the, the that's the SAR, the red, and the EEC is the blue. The SAR is lower in the winter, and the EC is lower in the winter. As you go into spring, that EC starts to go up a little bit, the SAR goes up. In the summer, it's, it's higher, and in fall, it kind of comes back down to spring. And if you think about that, it kind of makes sense. And one of the reasons it makes sense is, as the temperature goes up, there's more evaporation happening everywhere along the line. Everywhere in the, along, any place the water is, when the evaporation happens, the water goes away, but the salt stays behind. Now, the one thing to look at this is, though, if you go back to that last table, as, as the SAR goes up, you kind of need that EC to go up with it. 
because if the EC goes up, it's more manageable. And in this case, that they, since they kind of track each other, that's a good thing. The other thing to realize is, if you look at this, there's sort of a, you can kind of see it. If you look at this little bump, all, those are daily changes. And those daily changes happen because people have soft water softeners. They have them set up on 24-hour schedules to replenish their resins. So that's when they run the sodium back through the resin. And that's when they flush huge amounts of salt into the, into the sewer. So you have to realize that it may be a situation where if you're getting direct effluent, if you're irrigating at night, it's going to be different water than if you're irrigating the day. Or depending on how long the retention time is from the time at which it goes through the plant until you get it. So that's a situation where you might want to do a little bit more monitoring. And most sewer treatment plants will monitor for EC, but they will not monitor for the sodium-calcium ratio. It's a little more expensive. So the water we had here, most, most of it was the SAR between 6 and 12. And the EC was between 1.9 and point, well, 0.5 and 1.9, which meant it's not down here where there's no restriction in the use. But you're in this slight to moderate, so it is a manageable situation. The thing that makes it, that you have to be really concerned about with this is making sure you keep your leaching fractions up. If you don't have your leaching fractions, then that salinity is going to just stay in the root zone and, be, and cause problems for your plants. So here's another one to look at, it's nitrogen and phosphorus. Red is nitrogen, blue is phosphorus, and typically in fertilizer you think about phosphorus as P2, P2O5, but this is actual milligrams per liter of just straight phosphorus and straight nitrogen. So not nitrate N, it's just N and P. And one thing to notice here is you really see with this, Here's those diurnal changes. Those, those changes in how much nitrogen is coming out of, of the sewer treatment plant. If you look at it, that's, you know, it's going anywhere from 8 down to about 5. So high of, of 8 parts per million nitrogen, low of 5. One thing about this is, that's a significant amount of nitrogen you can get. If you think about this coming, going on all the time. Phosphorus doesn't change quite as much, but, but it still changes. So, if you were looking at just lettuce, let's see how much fertilizer we'll get out of this. So, U of A recommends for lettuce between 130 and, 100 and 300 pounds per acre nitrogen. If you met all of your ET demands with this water, that's going to give you about 20 to 30 pounds of nitrogen. Depending on how much water you had to apply, what your actual soil test said, you can get anywhere, anywhere between 5 and 20% of your total nitrogen needs for lettuce just out of this water. With phosphorus, between 2 and 5%. Sometimes you have specifically toxic compounds. Boron is one. For this, I chose just sodium chloride to look at the sodium chloride and for lettuce. So the recommendation is if you're Sodium chloride concentration is above 800 parts per million. That can be a problem for lettuce. And if you look, in winter, sodium chloride is right around that 800. This, this blue line, the sodium chloride index, what that is is I took and divided the actual number by 800. So if it's above one, that means it can be a problem. If it's below one, it's fine. So if you look in the spring, you're below one. In summer, you're right on one. In fall, you're below one. In winter, you're below one. So in essence, if you're growing with this water and you have a sodium chloride, a plant that has a problem with sodium chloride, in the summer months, you're right around that one. You're at that limit of you may have sodium chloride problems. And the thing where that's going to matter here, if you're growing lettuce and you're having to plant early, August, into August, first part of September, and you're using that, you're, you're sprinkling and you're using that water to germinate your seed and to keep things cool, you're right at that limit of maybe you're going to have too much sodium chloride. So then I talked about advanced treatment. Most of you will know about advanced treatment. One of the ones everyone would know about is reverse osmosis. And the way it works is you have a membrane here 
water can pass through, but salt can't. And what will end up happening is, because that happens, the salt wants to become the same concentration on both sides. So water will leave the side that has the low concentration and fill the side that has the high concentration until it gets to be the same concentration. So that's osmosis. And the way we do reverse osmosis is we take advantage of this and we put pressure on this side and push it down so we can start pushing just the water through that membrane. And for the most part, this is one of the places where if you, someone comes to you and said, yeah, let's put reverse osmosis on, your, on, on, on something so you can use the water, it's better water. You gotta be careful of that because about 99% of the sodium gets removed. But about 99.96% of the calcium gets removed. EC removal is about 99.95%. So you think, oh, that's really low salt water, that's great. Well, if you do the calculations, from the water we had, that I showed those, that data, I took the averages from that. The average sodium concentration was 277.3 milligrams per liter. Cal calcium was 57.05. But when we remove it, so we remove 99% of this sodium, we remove 99.94% of this, all of a sudden our EC, our, so the EC becomes 0.01, but the SAR is about 2. So the SAR is 2, EC is 0.01, you think that's really good water. But guess what? You put this on your soil, First thing that's going to happen to your soil is it's going to disperse, and you're never going to be able to fix it. Because the only way to fix it is now you've got to make it saline so you can leach out those so that sodium. So, just because it's really high quality water and there's not a lot of salt in it, there may be a problem with that water. You need to look at those calcium sodium ratios. So, the last thing I want to talk about, that especially since a lot of the growth down here is like you're growing lettuce and things like that. People are eating fresh. And that is salinity. That's what farmers need to be worried about. People who buy your produce, they don't care about salinity. What matters to them is what they read in the newspaper. And what they read in the newspaper are going to be things like pharmaceuticals and hormones and those kind of sorts of things. They're going to be so concerned about that. So... You know, we all go to the bathroom, we wash our clothes, we do stuff in the sink, and then we irrigate with that water. Food crops, we put in rivers, put on golf courses. So, one of the problems we have with, with pharmaceuticals in water is, you put a pharmaceutical in water, so when you take a, a pill, no matter what pill it is, anywhere between 10 and 80% of that pharmaceutical that you take to ingest, you're just going to excrete. Because you have to get your con the concentration of that pharmaceutical in your body up high enough that it can do its thing. But for the most part, your kidneys are removing it, your liver's removing it, things are trying to get rid of it. So, 70, on, on average, about 50% of what you take in, you just waste it down the drain. When you do that with an antibiotic, you're putting these low levels of antibiotics in the, in the environment, and that's where things like antibiotic resistance start to develop. That resistance can transfer to just soil microbes, and now all of a sudden you have antibiotic resistance happening all over. You get endo endocrine disruption. That is, in essence, a compound that looks like a hormone in your body, and it starts to behave like that. And I tell people, we, we talk about Estrogen and when we take the pill, that sort of thing. But estrogen has been in, in rivers a long time. People have been peeing in streams for a very long time. Nature can kind of deal with that. But we have things like in your, in your detergents for your clothes washer. What used to be phosphate soaps, because we want to remove phosphate, now use things like nonophenols. And nonophenols, when you put them in the environment, very rapidly turn into nonophenol ethoxylates, and they look just like estrogen. The concentration of estrogen in effluent is in the parts per billion. The concentration of nonophenols in effluent is in parts per million. Those are, things, those are the kinds of things that fish start to now get exposed to, and now you start having problems with fish and sexual dimorphism and that sort of thing. 
And then there's a potential we can overload the soil, because the soil is really good at, at removing these things, but you might get to the point where they get overloaded. You can have runoff, runoff and leaching of these compounds. There's this big study done, 2002, and if you notice here, quite a bit of the study was done in, in Arizona, and right there, that dot right there is the 91st Avenue Sewer Treatment Plant in the Salt River. And they took a sample from that location, and they found everything in that location. Because if you look at the Salt River as it comes out of 91st Avenue, there's no river, it's just an effluent. They find a lot of different compounds. These same kind of things look really scary to people. This is frequency detection, how often. And people start getting nervous about this. However, one thing I'll say, these concentrations are really low. They're parts per billion. I always like to say a part per billion is the equivalent of taking every single person on this whole earth, putting them all shoulder to shoulder in one place, paint eight of them red, find those eight people. That's a part per billion. But some things that happen, pseudomethan, it's Tylenol. This is a really busy slide, but just look right here. Brown tree snakes are in Guam. They were an important species during World War II. They're really poisonous, and there's no natural predators there. But if you look there, they estimate that Guam has about 15,000 of these snakes per square mile. That's a lot of snakes. They did find, though, that Tylenol, and 80, mill 80 milligrams of Tylenol will kill that brown tree snake. So now one of the ways they're trying to kill brown tree snakes is they load up rats with Tylenol and send them out there. To <laughs> <laughs> so this is the reason you need to worry about it, public perception. People are concerned about that. And if you're growing food, in, in, in essence, people start getting concerned and worried. So you do have to know what's going on. And there's potential that these things might become regulated. And who knows where that regulation will happen. The drinking water people, the easiest place to regulate is the drinking water. But the drinking water people will say, well, we're not the source of it. It's the sewage people. The sewage people will say, well, it's just too hard for us to deal with. So who knows? It might be regulated. If you take effluent that has some of this in it, they may start saying, making you put treatment on your farm. Mm -hmm. You don't know. So that's why you have to be aware of these issues. So here's a compound, carbamazepine. It's used for bipolar disorder and epilepsy. These are... This is how much is in the effluent. So the nanogram per liter, that's a part per billion. Anywhere from 250 down to about 70 parts per billion. And carbamazepine is one of those things that does not degrade. That's why I show that here. It's going to be one of the higher concentrations and you can find it everywhere. But so we wanted to look and see, does this compound go into the plant? So to get... To get we did have to do some, some experiments about taking it up, up into the plant. But one of the things that was interesting and we wanted to know was what happens depending on when you irrigate. So if you take soil, you simplify it down, it's just a bundle of tubes. Lots of little pores, they're like tubes. If you're in a saturated system, gravitational forces are really high, so water's going to go down. These matrix potential sources, the, the ones that hold the water in the soil, are really small in comparison. So it's leaching. As soon as you get filled capacity, they become the same. So there's nothing leaching out. It's all being held by the soil. As it dries down, these matrix potentials get really, really high. And that's what causes a plant to undergo water stress. It can't get the water out of the soil. The soil holds on to it tighter than the plant can get. So, you're all probably familiar with this term, available water, so that's between fill capacity and permanent wilting point. But we never go to permanent, permanent wilting point before we irrigate. We always irrigate before that because we don't want to have any yield loss. So here's a situation to just show sort of how that works. Depending on your soil type, there's fill capacity for, there's a permanent wilting point, and there's where you typically irrigate. So for a clay soil, that's how much water you typically have available. If you look at a sandy soil, that's how much water you typically have available. It's tiny because the water's all leached out or is all drained out, and there's very little water that's being held there for you to use. 
That's why everyone wants a nice loamy soil, because you see it has the highest amount of available water. So we ran an experiment where we wanted to measure what would happen if we took, put this compound, compound on a plant, will it be taken up in a food crop? We grew radishes. And here's sort of the take home. This is just actual concentration. So we irrigated. This, this number right here, the 17, is in essence we irrigated at one bar. So we let the water, the soil dry down to one bar. So that's typically where you would irrigate at. On these here, we irrigated at less than one bar. So we irrigated the same amount of water, just more often. I mean, none of these were ever water stressed. We just simply let them, but we wanted to look at the difference of this matrix potential effect. And as you see here, in the bulb, there's a little bit of an effect, and not much was taken up, which is great, because that's what you eat in radish for the most part. But look at this in the leaf. That goes to show that this compound was simply going with the water, going into the leaf, and when the leaf evaporated the water out, it left the compound behind. So if you translate that to say the lettuce, lettuce is what you eat. You eat the part that's evapotranspirating. And so you're going to have more of this compound there. Now these are all really small numbers, so don't let me think that I'm trying to worry you that they're, you're putting drugs into your, that the drugs are in your lettuce. But it's something to be aware of because it might become an issue down the road. And if you're aware of it, you can start to combat it. And one of the things you can do is, if you can irrigate more often, well, a lot less goes in. Because here's the last slide, and it's sort of the one that shows it, and that is that if we normalize for how much compound is actually put on, more of the compound ends up in the leaf if you let it dry down longer between irrigations than if you irrigate more often. And that's probably due to the fact that you're getting some concentration around the roots, and you're getting, there's some exclusion mechanisms that can occur, and you're just overcoming those exclusions. So, and again, these are really low, low numbers. You would have to eat, by definition, these are all drugs you take. Like, you can't say they're poisonous because they're prescribed for people to get them better. However, if you were to take this, this lettuce or this radish leaf and eat it, you'd have to eat thousands of pounds a day, every day to reach any sort of therapeutic dose. So with that, I'll take any questions. Did you scare this up? <laughs> you were concerned about the sodium absorption ratio uh, when we rever uh, do reverse osmosis. But then we're applying a ton of calcium with our fertilization. Wouldn't that balance out the sodium that stays? Sometimes it depends on how you get it there. If the calcium is always being applied with the water, you're fine. But if you happen to put the water on before you've put any of that calcium on, then you're going to disperse those soils right away. And then it's going to be hard to get any water through. A prime example is in the San Joaquin Valley, on the, on the east side, we always hear about the west side of San, the San Joaquin Valley, that's where they have high ground water tables and the selenium move. And so they're always trying to figure out how to irrigate and drain. If you go to the east side of the valley, you're in a situation where <coughs> the water that comes off of the Sierras early in the spring is so clean, it is so pure, that if they apply it to their soils right away, they can sometimes disperse their soils. So they try and do a little bit of mixing to take a little bit of water that has a little more salt in it to keep it. Because the sodium absorption ratio is one thing, but also if you have a really, 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 really pure water, it'll do the same thing. It'll disperse the soils. There's just not enough, uh, there are not enough ions to keep the soil. Active. What about rainwater? That's the same thing. In fact, is I it, tell is people, it, yeah. Does it disperse the soils? It does. I tell people in, in the Phoenix area, if you really want to get the most out of your rainfall, when it starts to rain, go turn your sprinklers on for about the first five minutes. And that first five minutes is going to then mix some saline water with the non-saline water and keep, and keep it open. And then you can turn the water off. 
and then all that rainfall is going to go in. You, you can see it if you put really, really high quality water on a salty soil, you'll disperse the soils right away. It doesn't have organic that. matter help. Organic matter that. very much helps that. But in, in, in the heat of Arizona, it's hard to have much organic matter. Yeah, you mentioned that back in 1908, your grandparents uh, uh, grew crops with uh, wastewater or, or sewer water. Did you have any problem with E. coli? <laughs> <laughs> they were a dairy, they had a dairy. So they were growing alfalfa and feeding it to cows. Cows may have got sick, I don't know. <laughs> but back then, I don't think people cared. <laughs> well, they've done this for a long time. In, in Paris, the Paris sewage farms, they had those going since the 17th century. That's the end of our session. Thanks, everyone, for coming.